Okay, off to you, Chuck. Okay, let me agree that I'm being recorded. Uh, hello, everyone. I uh, apologize for not making the meeting, but I've had some bad cold symptoms all week and didn't want to share them with you. Uh, all negative tests, though. Uh, our guest uh, tonight is a person who has been recognized uh, nationally uh, by the JCs for her outreach efforts uh, in astronomy. It's Dr. Caitlin Ahrens, and uh, she has a uh, Bachelor of Science degree in physics and astrophysics um, and geology from West Virginia University, and also a PhD in space and planetary science from the University of Arkansas. And she has spoken with us before, and we're thrilled to have her back because she's just a great pleasure uh, to have with us and uh, a very welcoming and accessible uh, person, uh, as you will see if you did not see her prior presentation to us. Uh, she works as a NASA postdoctoral fellow um, for the Goddard Space Flight Center um, and is a member of the Diviner Science team there. Um, as I mentioned before, she has been awarded uh, uh, status as one of 10 outstanding uh, young Americans uh, by the JCs, mostly because of her communication and outreach efforts in astronomy. Uh, her research involves uh, remote sensing of uh, icy surfaces and volatile interactions, such as uh, permanently shadowed craters on the moon and so forth. And her focus has been uh, in modeling thermal phases of ices on other worlds and determining their application to geophysical processes on those worlds. And I think her dissertation for a PhD involved uh, Pluto ices, if I'm not correct. And uh, she's with us uh, tonight to talk about future lunar missions, I believe. I hope I got that right, Caitlin. And yep. <laughs> uh, again, my apology that we didn't get the link to you when I promised it, uh, but thank you so much for joining us again. And I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm so excited to chat about lunar missions. I there's there's quite a bit of them. Uh, some of them uh, I realized while making the PowerPoint, I wasn't able to uh, to get certain information because it wouldn't be publicly available. However, I uh, you fine group uh, will actually get to see something that was just released just a couple hours ago uh, from NASA uh, involving the Artemis three uh, um, crew. So what? going to be very, very exciting. And uh, because uh, it's now been released just a couple hours ago, I, uh, you know, you, you guys are going to be pretty much one of the first, uh, you know, public to, to see the exciting news. Uh, so however, you have to survive a few, uh, a few PowerPoint slides first, though. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get into sharing my screen. There's so many things on my computer. Oh no. Okay, here we go. Awesome. All right. So we're finally going back to the moon. Uh, but I, I love to chat about what have we done? There's always lessons learned uh, through the many, many, many lunar missions that, that we that had uh, previously. And so taking those lessons learned and then going forth uh, with how do we improve our instruments I uh, maybe even come up with new instruments, new ways to figure out um, maybe the seismicity of the moon or learning about the mineralogy of the moon, uh, learning about the different kinds of mapping uh, of different landing sites on the moon. Uh, but the moon, while uh, you know it's it's gray and gray, uh, you know, definitely not very colorful in any sense of the imagination, but the geology of the moon, you have the near side here on the on the left and then the, the far side on the right here. There's so much different kinds of geology involved. Uh, so you have lunar volcanism. So the, uh, the darker patches here, if anybody has done the uh, Astronomical League, um, lunar observation uh, observation uh, program to get like the pin and the certificate. I highly recommend 
uh, that program, if you have not, it really gives you a, a sense of uh, like how to map things around the moon. I have done it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so, uh, so this these dark patches here of of Mare and even some some minor spots here and there on the far side, all that is crystallized, hardened volcanic magma <laughs> on the moon. It's it's so wild to believe that. Uh, and then the just beautiful mountain ranges, uh, many many different kinds of craters. There's landslides. Uh, for some of these craters as well, you have pieces of, of the moon that have scrunched together and formed little ridges, and we call those wrinkle ridges. So the uh, best way to describe those would be um, you know, just a nice smooth bed sheet, and then you just kind of uh, um, scoot the bed sheet, and then it wrinkles up. That's pretty much wrinkle ridges uh, on, on the moon. But uh, even just the mare, uh, themselves would have different kinds of tectonics going on. So you would have, let's see, let's see if I can have a laser pointer here. Ha ha. Uh, you would have, uh, you know, the, this would be considered a wrinkle ridge over here. You would have all of these little tiny uh, uh, craters here, but then some of them could be aligned and we would call those pit chains or crater chains. Uh, so those would be, um, tiny little collapsed uh, lava tubes. There's a really pretty crater up there. Uh, like I said, different kinds of craters. So you would have craters that would have uh, different kinds of colored ejecta. So you would have a, an impact crater hit the surface and then excavate some sort of bright material and then have it splay out uh, in different directions. So this is what we would have with this particular crater here. Uh, all, all sorts of uh, uh, interesting riles and, and graben. Um, so, so riles and graben are, are fairly similar as far as how they were formed. Grabens, however, are, are pretty much the narrow, whereas riles are just grabens um, with a flare for the dramatic. Uh, so, so in this case, this would be a, a uh, a rile or just a very much a large collapsed lava tube um, in that regard. So this would be considered the entrance and then it would weave its way through. So very, very once dynamic. Now is the moon considered currently dynamic? Uh, not as much. Uh, there, there are moon quakes and, and we still have um, data from the, uh, from the Apollo seismometers. Uh, not recently though, but you know, it, what the moon had uh, you know, several billion years ago though, was very, very active in its, in its tectonics and volcanism. Uh, so just some, some more ideas as to some weird uh, tectonic uh, lines going on here. So how the surface would just kind of curve over and then crack the surface there. Uh, this little this little guy here that well, it looks like a little caterpillar, or a little worm. This would be one of those pit chains. Um, so it would it would be very similar to a graben, but then uh, it would just collapse and collapse and collapse and collapse and collapse. Uh, so these are are not impact craters <laughs> that have formed a line per se. It's just more of a, a just a collapse feature there. And then this this big uh, um, graben turned cliff face here is just absolutely gorgeous. So I, I'm currently actually writing paper on, on this particular part of the moon. Uh, but the moon has been very, very busy uh, as far as different kinds of missions go. And I, I, I'm not gonna touch base on every single one of these, but most of these landing sites I wanna do recognize here is that we pretty much barely scratched the surface of the moon for sure, but we've pretty much concentrated only around the mare regions, which is fine. It's much safer. Uh, it's definitely flatter uh, to land there, but we need to start exploring other places though. Uh, so, you know, just let's just start getting ready to figure out where all do we wanna go explore uh, on the moon. So let's go back. Uh, for a bit though with uh, the pioneers and the Lunas uh, and the Rangers. So these were definitely the test runs 
uh, the test run era of lunar exploration. So we didn't expect these to survive. We didn't expect these to land safely at all. We just wanted to test communications. If anything, we didn't really strap cameras on uh, onto these. We just really wanted to see, can we send some small uh, piece of spacecraft to the moon, let it radio back, and then usually not uh, survive on a, on in any case on the way back. Uh, this is a really fun news article that I, I have found, uh, the Ranger 4 uh, uh, spacecraft crashing uh, at nearly 6,000 miles per hour. Oh, what a projectile uh, poor Ranger had. So, oh boy. Um, yeah, so needless to say that we've had uh, several instances where like, okay, you know what, there's there's lessons learned here. Let's figure out how we can better uh, have a better mission architecture. Uh, let's strap on a camera as well. Uh, so finally with the with the um, more advanced Lunas and, and Rangers and then the Zond uh, uh, orbiters as well. Zond really had a lot of fantastic uh, imaging, imaging systems on there. And then definitely the Apollo uh, missions to follow, finally landing with Apollo 11. But even before Apollo, it was still test run after test run after test run. Uh, it truly wasn't a, okay, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna land. Uh, it, it truly took a while to understand not only the surface of the moon, but up close and personal surface of the moon as well. So different kinds of surveyor um, surveying uh, uh, of the moon as well. So just some example of some Zond uh, images I really, really enjoy, especially on the far side of the moon. Um, these, so these are one of the very uh, you know, early images of the far side of the moon, and we're able to see bits and pieces of, uh, of some Mare regions back there. Oh, it's gorgeous. <laughs> but this is what I'm meaning uh, before we even landed anybody on the moon. I, uh, you know, what, what's the soil? Uh, like, even though the Apollo astronauts later I uh, revealed like, oh, this is, this is weird. Uh, and I'll, I'll reveal what they said about the soil here in a bit. But just looking at these images, we're like, oh, you know what? The moon is not as smooth and pretty as we think it is. It's very gravelly. Um, it's very dusty as well. That was definitely something we've learned through the surveyor landings. It, it just kicks up a lot of dust, but I you can very much see just, to, uh, just how pebbly the surface is. So would that have created some some minor hazards, absolutely. Um, so a lot of launch pad architecture would have uh, had to be reiterated and, and to get ready for Apollo 11 from there. But then finally, uh, the era of Apollo really, really uh, shined through for our lunar exploration. So when the Apollo astronauts uh, finally got to the moon, they realized that the closest thing that they can think about with how the moon felt and I, I myself have talked to several astronauts about this, is that uh, it feels uh, like flour, uh, like, like baking flour, is that it, it's very hard, it could be very compact, but you could also just kick it with your feet and, and dust will fly off very, very easily. Uh, so it took them several tries to realize just how, how dense a lot of the soil can be. Uh, but Apollo really uh, did a fantastic job with not just taking pretty pictures or anything and, and uh, leaving instruments and getting us back data, but also getting lunar samples to us too. Uh, so, I mean, we can just look at, at panoramic uh, images from the Apollo missions all night long, for sure. Uh, I, I highly encourage you to Google uh, Apollo uh, panoramas. It just absolutely uh, stunning, stunning landscapes. But again, it's not as, as flat and smooth as we originally thought. There is a lot of boulders going on here, uh, some really pretty geology here. So this is from Apollo 17. And 
unsure if the projector uh, in, in the shared room there would be able to pick it up though, but uh, where my laser pointer is uh, circling here, there's almost kind of a, a reddish uh, rusty tint to this. So this was a bit of a headache. Um, Otto, all right, I see a thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, so this was definitely an interesting headache for the uh, Apollo 17 astronauts, uh, especially for the one geologist astronaut that we had, which was astronaut Harrison Schmidt. Uh, so Harrison took this picture and, and, and he saw the soil and he was like, it's, it's, it's rust? Why is it kind of that orangish reddish color? What is going on here? And so he was so excited about this and, and he was telling Houston like, what? what is going on with the soil? It's orange-ish. It's brownish orange. What's going on here? So excited. So they baggied uh, as much samples as they can, obviously, without uh, you know taking too much uh, with them. But they got excited. They put it in a baggie. It's all sealed up and everything. Yeah, let's, let's bring it on home. And they got into uh, the lab, into like this beautiful vacuum-sealed little chamber. They opened up the sample, and it's just brown. Wait, wait, hang on. It's it's just brown and gray, but it was. But we promise it was like that rusty orangish color on the moon. Why why is it no longer? What happened? And so, thankfully, it wasn't. I uh, I uh, it didn't get contaminated or anything. What happens here though is that it's light playing a trick. Uh, essentially, it's what is in the soil that is reflecting the light to make it that kind of an orangish color. Now, this is an interesting finding though, is what type of mineral they found to make it this kind of interesting color on the moon, and then not so much in a laboratory, is what this is, is that it's volcanic glass. They found volcanic, uh, uh, just a, a pit of volcanic glass, and glass can be very, very refractive. So sunlight just happened to hit that spot at just the right angle to make it that kind of a rusty orangish color but it wasn't there was some rust in in for sure uh but it wasn't just iron there was volcanic glass um so very very similar to volcanic glass that we would have here uh in hawaii so very very fun stuff so there are uh really beautiful uh, websites out there. And I'll, I'll share the link uh, at the end of the presentation here though, but there's a really beautiful website that has uh, all the different kinds of lunar rocks that have been collected, all the different kinds of pictures. And it's freely available um, for your perusal as well. The really pretty part that I enjoy is looking at the thin sections of these uh, uh, lunar meteorites brought back by Apollo. And it's all uh, it's all archived uh, on this website. So thin sections can really tell us a lot about the different kinds of minerals, the different kinds of chemistry going on uh, within these meteorites, but also just really gives us a sense of just how dynamic the moon would have been with the different kinds of minerals. Uh, so Eugene Shoemaker uh, gave us a lot to think about with minerals and impact craters. Uh, the best example was Meteor Crater out in Arizona. If anybody's been to Meteor Crater, uh, then it's a fantastic place. If you have not been to Meteor Crater yet, I highly encourage you to go. It's a beautiful place. But uh, a theory uh, for a while was that it was a large collapsed volcano uh, or what's called a caldera until I... I uh, the team and also involving Eugene Shoemaker was like, hey, wait, hang on. I, this, this is probably a, an impact crater. Uh, we need to go in the center and figure out what kind of minerals uh, are, in the, are in the middle uh, because certain minerals will show up if you have extreme temperature and pressure as with an impact crater, uh, as with an impact force being much, much stronger than just a simple volcano collapse. And lo and behold, we found uh, what's called shock quartz. Uh, we also found um, different highly temperature and pressurized uh, variations of quartz 
uh, as well. Um, so, so that was pretty much our, our smoking gun minerals. So finding these kind of minerals in lunar meteorites are very, very important. But also they're just really, really pretty to look at. <laughs> All the pretty, pretty colors. Uh, so moving on then uh, past the Apollo era, very, very quiet. Uh, through most of the late 70s all the way into the 90s. Um, so the uh, Hinton and Clementine uh, started to really give us a sense of solar wind. Uh, so Hinton had a, had a lot of like solar interactions. How did the solar wind interact with the moon? So that was mostly with Hinton. Um, and that was early, early Japanese space agency there. And then Clementine uh, gave us a, a better mineral map. Uh, so this was Clementine data. Um, some of us still use Clementine data. <laughs> I still use some Clementine uh, data. So it's it's a bit low raspy in a way, it gets the job done. Uh, so you have Clementine there and then eventually learning, okay, you know what, let's, let's build up our mineral cameras, let's build up our um, imaging cameras from there. So the, the better uh, mineral camera that we have uh, since then is Kaguya. Lunar Prospector, I'll, I'll get to here in a bit. Uh, so Lunar Prospector and Elcross were very, very fun. Um, so we got to purposefully smack into the moon uh, with those. So I'll, I'll show Lunar Prospector here in a bit. Uh, then, then the start of the Chang'e uh, uh, era and then the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, congratulations to the team because they just got an extension from NASA. So we are still flying high for uh, at least another five years. So woohoo, <laughs> we're, we're still going strong. Yeah, so I, I love showing this video of, of Lunar Prospector. And three, two, one, boop, <laughs> there it goes. So why do we want to purposefully crash into the moon? And as much as I would love to say the answer because it's fun, uh, <laughs> it's, it's obviously for, for science. So impacting something into the moon, you can get a lot of different kinds of materials to um, be excavated. And what's interesting is thankfully the moon is just close enough. You make a big enough splash uh, with your um, with your impactor, like Prospector, and and then with Elcross later, uh, you could also get ground telescopes, large ground telescopes, uh, anything from, uh, especially from Mauna Kea, to look at the moon and to actually have data on the uh, on the impact. And so uh, for Lunar Prospector, I don't remember which telescopes we used, but at least for Elcross impacting a crater uh, on the south pole of the moon. We definitely had quite a few ground-based telescopes to point and wait for the impact and then to uh, pick up any kind of chemical signatures uh, of what would have been wafted into the exosphere of the moon. And we were able to confirm water ice. We were able to confirm uh, quite a bit of hydrogen uh, in that part of the lunar south pole. That's fantastic. Okay, so there's uh, there's Kaguya there. So uh, so side by side comparison between your Clementine mineral map here and then Kaguya. So yep, a little bit higher resolution with with Kaguya, but both maps are uh, are very similar, uh, just slightly different resolutions. But I uh, but yeah, let's talk about lunar reconnaissance orbiter. So. A lot of fabulous instruments here, uh, turning on and off and looking at different places across the moon. Uh, the fact that we're still going, we're still using all these instruments uh, since 2009, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, many, many different kinds of instruments too. Uh, so you have, um, Whack and whack and knack <laughs> are are the cameras. So you're you've got your wide angle and, and your uh, narrow angle. Lamp is your Lyman Alpha mapping. Mini RF uh, is radio frequencies. Um, I specifically work with the DLRE or Diviner. That is where we take the lovely temperatures 
uh, of the moon uh, kind of deal. And then Lola is your uh, topographic map. So your laser altimeter there. So looking at all the different kinds of data sets here, it really depends upon what all you want to do. If you want to do chemistry specifically, you would want to do your neutron. That would be uh, the LEND instrument, or you would want to do uh, the ultraviolet uh, camera system from there. Maybe sometimes with infrared, but infrared and radar are really good for your ice. If you really want to look for your frozen volatiles, uh, your, your different kinds of elevation can help with the different kinds of geology, all different kinds of stuff here. Um, so this is what like our, our neutron uh, data would look like. Bit low res, bit fuzzy, uh, but still gets the job done as to where, where all the pretty um, neutron counts are. So why neutron counts? Uh, this tells us where all the, the higher concentrations of hydrogen are, because if you can find the hydrogen, you're more likely to find your, your H2O. So let's talk about the South Pole of the Moon. Uh, South Pole of the Moon has some really, really interesting craters. Uh, so, uh, so deep and so dark really takes the phrase where the sun don't shine to a whole different level here. Uh, so deep, dark craters. There's also deep, dark craters on the North Pole of the Moon, but the South Pole of the Moon is going to get a lot of attention um, with some upcoming missions, though. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll explain about the South Pole here in a bit, though. So this is uh, what we're currently working with. We're still ongoing with LRO. Um, uh, uh, obviously, a lot of the, the Chongyi uh, ones are, are still somewhat going. I believe we're, we're going to get into um, more Chongyi missions here in a bit. Chongyi 4 uh, had an interesting uh, biology experiment. Now this one, this one was was a bit of a lessons learned uh, on this one. So Changi Four had a little biodome, just really really small, cute little biodome, uh, and it had cotton seeds, and it, it actually grew cotton. Yeah, you know, just took a uh, it took about a day, and and started to sprout as as you see uh, here to just a little bit of the left. Unfortunately, this is probably one of the very few images that they have released. Uh, mainly because the very next day, what happened was that the, the pressure seal broke uh, from the extreme temperatures of the far side of the moon and it destroyed uh, the cotton the very next day. So uh, so this whole experiment has been retracted uh, since then, but not a, a, not a huge failure. I mean, yeah, biology-wise, uh, no more cotton, but what we've learned now, uh, you know, how can we improve uh, upon that design uh, for later? Uh, so you know, we're we're definitely having uh, a lot of fun stuff with uh, SLS, especially with uh, you know coming up with with Artemis. That's going to be fun. Um, eventually, with uh, the Artemis crew lander, uh, is still you know getting getting ready for that. The, these Luna missions, unfortunately, are uh, on hold at the moment. But with two missions that are missing uh, specifically for this timeline are Viper and Lunar Trailblazer. In reality, there's about, about a dozen uh, different kinds of lunar missions that are being planned. They just haven't had a specific timeline yet, uh, whether the projects or the rocket themselves or the lander themselves or the rover themselves pretty much just got released or even just chosen barely a few months ago. So uh, so this list is going gonna, is gonna to grow. I, I give it another year or so, and this list is, is just going to really, really be full. Um, but Viper and Lunar Trailblazer, I'll, I at least have information, public information to share uh, for this evening. But Artemis 1, 2, and 3. Oh, goody. <laughs> so Artemis 1 I will be uncrewed. It's, a, it's a, what we call our dress rehearsal, um, round one dress rehearsal. And so uh, we're going to have a SLS Orion spacecraft go around the moon uh, a few times and come back. Uh, so launch is coming up. Oh, excitement. Yay, August 29th. Uh, there's going to be plenty of NASA live TV 
uh, like viewing parties and live broadcasts and everything. So I hope your group is able to, to partake in any of that. Uh, and then we have Artemis II. Uh, this at least will be uh, fully crewed, but still, still dress rehearsal. We're not going to land on the moon just yet until Artemis III. Now, Artemis III, lots of planning is going underway uh, right now. It's, it's going to get interesting. But as soon as Artemis III uh, becomes very much the test run, boots on the ground, then we'll want to do a regular cadence. Um, that, not as fast as Apollo, uh, but definitely some sort of regular cadence of, uh, you know, how can we make them slightly different from each other? I uh, will want to propose many more instruments throughout each Artemis uh, uh, landing as well. What all would we want to do? But Artemis right now is, is currently focusing on the south pole of the moon. So this is the pretty much the same image that I just showed you just with different lighting conditions, but all the different shadows that you see here are pretty much perpetual shadow regions um, or how we like to call them permanently shadowed regions. So all the pretty little uh, orange perimeters here are where we have consistent shadow. And with those consistent shadows, this is the literal cool part some of these shadowy parts can get as cold as Pluto. So awesome. I, so when I mean as cold as Pluto, we're, yeah, I work in Kelvin temperatures here. So we're talking about 30 Kelvin minimum, maybe even down to 20 Kelvin. So we're talking negative 400 some degrees Fahrenheit uh, at some of these shadowed areas here. So very very cold. So this is what the Viner data would look like. This is the kind of data sets that I work on. No, the moon is not on fire. Uh, it just means relatively warmer temperatures versus the really, really pretty blue cold uh, temperatures here. So this would be considered summer and then winter. So the more purple the area, the much, much colder you can get. Now, the fun part is that it's not just water ice at these really, really cold, uh, permanently shadowed regions, or PSRs is what we nickname them. Uh, so that's part of my job that I'm working with with the Definer Science team uh, and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, folks is that it's not just water ice. This is the really, really fun part. Uh, there could be so many different types of chemistry at those extreme very, very cold temperatures uh, and, and somewhat low pressures as well. So slightly higher temperatures, uh, you can get some sulfur and sodium. Okay, you know, that you don't want to deal with sulfur ice. It, it could get a little, a little tricky, but way, way down into the cold uh, bits, much, much colder than um, your, your water area here. You got some really, really dangerous ices. Uh, very, very fun ices that we should poke and prod and study, uh, but very, very hazardous and, and very careful to poke and prod. Um, so you got your ammonia, your sulfur dioxide. Uh, formaldehyde is, is still debatable. Uh, carbon dioxide, absolutely. Lots of carbon dioxide, that's fine. Um, but hydrogen sulfide, oof. Oh, that's a, that's a very, very dangerous ice to, uh, to deal with. But lo and behold, we've, we've got Artemis. And uh, so, so drum roll, everybody, I'm going to be sharing with you some, uh, some information about Artemis 3 that was just released just a couple hours ago. So, so excited to finally share this. Uh, we have 13, uh, so far, 13 different spots uh, that we want to land our Artemis three crew on. Now the fun part is to take the 13 and narrow it down to one to get us ready for Artemis three. So this is where uh, the fun work begins. This was the hard part, was to narrow down the entirety of the South Pole of the moon and narrow it down to at least 13 different areas. So these 13 areas was just released just a couple hours ago. So yay. So like I said, now the fun work begins to kind of uh, really nitpick across all these spots and go, okay, where's 
where's our science priorities? Why Hayworth versus Unmanson versus Shackleton? Where, uh, where would be the safer uh, areas uh, or the more extreme environments? How can we, where can we safely land in one area versus the other? But all boils down to what kind of science would we wanna do as well? Uh, maybe the ice at, uh, at say Faustini uh, versus Malapert would be, they would be very, very different. Uh, so once we get our science objectives really figured out, once we figure out our, our actual landing site from all this 13, that also works in tandem in parallel with what kind of instruments would we wanna bring? I, you know, seismometers or, or thermometers, you would want to have um, different kinds of magnetic uh, or even plasma type instruments as well. We want to see how much radiation is involved with the pole of the moon. Turns out there's quite a bit, but we don't really fully understand how much radiation is going on at these, at these places. Uh, so some other missions to look forward to is Lunar Trailblazer. So I, I got to I hand it to uh, the team for their fabulous logo here because there's a lot of fun Easter eggs that I want to share um, with you guys. This is probably one of the most uh, fun mission logos uh, for quite a while now. Lots of fun Easter eggs. So the first obvious Easter egg here is the teardrop shape of the logo because its main purpose is where's the water? Where is the water on the moon? Uh, so, so that's a that's an obvious Easter egg. The other Easter egg is it wants to really concentrate on where's the water at the South Pole of the Moon. Uh, the the red and blue streaks here uh, um, tell us that we're looking at different wavelengths. Um, so that gives us a better sense of it's not just one wavelength, it's not just uh, one tiny part of the infrared. We're looking at different kinds of wavelengths here, and that's great because water can give us different kinds of, uh, of chemistry. You, you would think H2O, how, how complex can it be? Uh, it turns out H2O in itself can be very, very complex. So we need as much uh, wavelengths to study the water as much as we can. Next one is, uh, is this lovely little rainbow here. What's fun about this is, is not just, uh, you know, you might be thinking, oh, a rainbow bridge. What's going on here? Nope, it's actually the shape of, uh, of this band here. It's supposed to also signify different kinds of wavelengths by just the rainbow color. But this, why the shape here, why the dip is because that's what, would, that's what water would look like. That's the signature of the water that we want to find. That lovely wide dip. As soon as we see that, we know we have water. Uh, and then, I love this little Easter egg. Bits and pieces of the stars are the H2O molecules, just kind of hanging out in space there. So really, really nice tiny detail there, but it's little little molecules uh, spinning around there. So lovely little Easter eggs. And then this uh, this mission here, Viper, uh, is going to be so much fun. I'm looking. I'm really looking forward to Viper here. So this is a rover, fairly small rover with a drill. Uh, it's it's going to have a little bit of a light source. It's going to get really up and close to one of those really cold ice spots, uh, one of those PSRs. It has a whole laboratory in its belly uh, down here, along with, like I said, a, a drill. I believe the drill is called Trident. I don't remember the, the acronym for it, though, but as Trident for a drill, uh, it's... Uh, it's um, spectrometers for the chemistry to uh, pretty much look for where's where's all the water, where's all the, say, hydrogen, where's all the carbon dioxide, where's the methane. Uh, looking for all those different kinds of pieces of chemistry uh, is called like the near-infrared um, and visible spectroscopy system, I believe, it's, it's something like that, but the acronym it, it spells out nervous. So, so it has a nervous system. <laughs> Uh, so where it's going to land, it just chose its landing site uh, just a few months ago, actually. So it's it's going to be close, very, very close to the Nobile um, crater here. 
So very, very nice for that team. Now, real quick with Apollo. So this is a really interesting idea. There have been uh, samples from the Apollo missions that have never been opened. And this was on purpose. This was uh, specifically in, uh, in writing from the Apollo era uh, to not open certain samples until certain technologies were improved to take a look at these samples. And so fast forward nearly 50 years into the future, our technology has definitely improved uh, since then. And so we're, we're finally getting into opening up these samples. So this is a whole team effort uh, called ANCSA or NASA's Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis Initiative. Uh, so ANCSA um, truly just started uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, they're, they're currently writing a bunch of papers right now, uh, hopefully to be published very soon as to what all kinds of cool findings that they've been having with uh, some of their samples. But this is a fantastic initiative because uh, because of our technology that we should be more aware of how do we sample these? How do we also make sure that we don't contaminate these samples either? That was a that wasn't really a concern uh, during the Apollo era. It was just kind of like, OK, cool. I brought home a moon rock. Awesome. Uh, but now, since then, we're now realizing, okay, planetary production is now a huge part of NASA. Now it, it even has its its own branch in NASA. So we have to be very, very, very careful. Yeah, so don't want to contaminate the samples whatsoever. Uh, so part of that initiative, uh, this is a brand new center that was formed in Goddard called the Astrobiology at Goddard um, Space Flight Center. Uh, so. This is a really nice part of that initiative of uh, making sure our return samples come back as pristine and untouched as possible. I, just a little fun plug here as well. The Encyclopedia of Lunar Science is almost complete. Hooray! Uh, this has been a nearly five year endeavor. Uh, and I myself have uh, helped edit and author uh, bits and pieces of the encyclopedia for the past three years now. So it's almost done and it will be fully publicly available very soon. You are able to read bits and pieces of the encyclopedia now, but it's almost over everybody. So excited. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of links here uh, and I'll happily uh, share them with Chuck and he can uh, disperse them uh, for everybody to have fun uh, and, and look through the different kinds of lunar samples from the Apollo missions, look at the really pretty pictures uh, from there. Uh, there is one link that I, I will uh, show you guys in, in real time right now, and that is a uh, quick map. So if you, I, um, this is really fun for classrooms uh, as well, or just for your own entertainment. If you personally want to just play around uh, with um, very simple lunar data from different uh, instruments, specifically with LRO, but also Kuguya or even um, with Clementine as well. Uh, Quick Map is a really, really fun uh, mapping and it's free. There's, there's no download or anything. There, there, there's nothing horribly fancy with it whatsoever. I'm gonna stop sharing that for now so that way I can uh, hang on. Uh, my my computer uh, decided to just not have fun with this. Okay, here we go. Let me reshare. Okay, so I'm gonna share. This is Quick Map. Um, so you truly just Google Quick Map again. I'll, I'll share the link with Chuck, and he can disperse it to everybody. But as soon as you open up uh, the link, I it pops up with the moon, you can you can scroll into different areas. I uh, you can have different projections. Say if we want to go to the South Pole of the Moon, there it is. There's Edmondson. So very, very pretty. But you can do uh, different kinds of overlays, you can do different kinds of instruments here. Let's go back to I'll do near side. 
So say if you want to look at, uh, uh, let's see, let's do olivine. So different kinds of olivine minerals from Kaguya there. And you can, you can zoom around, you can, you can play with it. You can go like, oh, what's this like really pretty red spot over here? And I uh, just truly just play around with the different colors and different layers. I, uh, you can, you can change your color scale. If you're, if you're not into that kind of color scale, you can change it up. There it is. That's a really pretty detailed version of that. So again, this is freely available. Uh, to just kind of peruse and, and have fun with. Uh, a lot of us uh, lunar scientists use Quick Map um, to help publish papers and also uh, as a good way to kind of double check and make sure we're actually pointing in the right area on the moon. Uh, I could give you guys a quick glance as to the different areas I'm working on currently on the moon. Uh, one is this particular part here. So this was that really pretty big Graben part of the moon. The fun part is, is that this may look very unseeming here, but this is a giant, uh, well, I shouldn't say giant. This is actually quite small. I'll show you the giant one here in a bit. This is actually a, a very uh, small lunar volcanic dome over here. So you can see the different layers already, already popping up, but that's a, that's a volcanic dome right there so that's that's one project i'm working on right now <laughs> oh no there goes the moon well <laughs> sometimes it takes a while for for the layers to to pop up and then there's there's a big dome here that i'm i'm uh writing a paper on as well too so all all sorts of really fun stuff with the moon um, the stuff that I wasn't particularly able to share, I, at least visuals with tonight, I will be able to share uh, what exactly is going on. So NASA uh, and a few other private industries are uh, essentially bringing out uh, proposals for very small missions. And you either propose instruments uh, to eventually go to bits and pieces of the moon, or you propose a lander uh, or even a, a very small rover at a particular location, and you have to write a proposal as to, like, I want to send a lander to this per part of the moon because of this kind of, of science, or maybe there's just some really weird geology over there and over there, uh, and so on. So all of that is is being worked on right now. Uh, so there's dozens and dozens and dozens of proposals uh, currently being worked on right now uh, or even being reviewed right now. So many different areas uh, that we want to explore. So it's it's truly not just looking at mare anymore. There's uh, what's called irregular mare patches or imps <laughs> uh, that are, are broken up pieces of Mare and uh, not fully developed volcano systems. And we're not entirely sure how they would have formed. They look very weird. Uh, but we want to eventually send a mission in there. Uh, you also have the Groot Heisen domes. So very, very large, um, beautiful uh, volcanic domes on the moon as well. Uh, you also have the, um, the lunar swirls. Those are really pretty uh, as well. That, that would have had some sort of magnetic uh, swirl, uh, solar interactions on the surface of the moon. But again, we don't fully understand how solar wind and, and magnetism even work uh, on the moon. So lots of, lots of fun uh, possible landing sites for the moon. If anything, the moon is gonna get very, very busy uh, in pretty much the next decade and beyond. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you so much again for, for having me here tonight and to chat about a lot of uh, really cool moon uh, missions to come. So thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, I, while others are coming up with some questions, I have a couple. 
Um, I've been reading lately that uh, lunar dust is thought to be far more harmful to equipment and perhaps to human health than it had been previously thought to be. Uh, have you run across any of that research? Absolutely. Uh, so, so there's a, a couple of different initiatives going on. Uh, a, a lot of big help is through the University of Central Florida. So they have a lab called the Exolith Lab which is a little hard to say, uh, but Exolith uh, specifically makes fake moon dust. Uh, and that, uh, they make mass productions of this stuff too. So that way uh, we lab people can bring it to our labs and either test instruments, we can test spacesuits, we can test um, static electricity with the dust as well. We can test all these different things with the fake moon dust. Uh, so obviously we don't have to scoop some from the moon and bring it back. That that's uh, that's a little that's a little expensive there. So at least if you make fake moon dust, that'll be great. But point being is at least we have the resources to test all these different things. Um, so testing uh, different ways that moon suits don't have to be um, statically charged and and just get a bunch of dust onto the spacesuits. Uh, we're testing different architectures of landing pads. Make sure that when the landing pad hits at a certain velocity and angle, it doesn't puff up a, a lot of dust. Um, another interesting aspect of lunar dust as well is that um, if you heat up the surface uh, enough from your side and far side and, and you know, <laughs> the moon going around the earth here if you heat up the, the soil enough there are uh bits of charged dust particles that will just waft into the air and it will settle back down but if you have a constant lofting and and settling of of dust there's already some sort of weird dynamic going on here so there are some instruments in in process to understand that better. So that the Apollo uh, astronauts have seen that uh, it, it's, I believe their terminology for it was uh, lunar air glow or lunar dust glow. Um, so definitely Google, <laughs> Google that, but it, it, it was fascinating to know that the Apollo astronauts are like, oh, that's weird. Oh, we'll figure that out later. You're referring, well, you're, later. you're referring to a sunrise effect that they observed on the horizon before the sun actually reached the horizon because of dust. Somewhat, yeah. somewhat similar to that. Yeah. Yeah. Not not as pretty as yeah. Earth sunrises and sunsets, but definitely some layer of a a, a thicker dust that is being lofted about. Uh, I, for for a period of time, so all all of this dust uh, is it dangerous? Absolutely, it's very very hazardous. You do not want to breathe that stuff in. Uh, a lot of it is is dusty, or it's yeah, dust is dust. Oh, good. Okay, glad we cleared that up. It's glassy, is what I was trying to say. Uh, there's there's bits and pieces of volcanic glass, um, and uh, and glass will will stick into your lungs. So definitely not not a good idea to you, know, you you take off your spacesuit at the end of the day you don't want to automatically do that <laughs> that would be bad and does your research also reach um i read an article i think it was about a year ago or so about water molecules bouncing along the surface of the moon on this sunlit side um Yes, that, that is very, very true. Um, so my research in particular does not uh, touch on that because I'm more interested in solid crystallized ice uh, on the moon. As soon as it, it leaves its crystallized state or it sublimates away. Not your department. Or, not my department. <laughs> when it, once, once it's not solid anymore, it's someone else's problem. And, and then I'd be very sad because yeah. then my, my ice sample just went kablooey uh, <laughs> but but there but i do know some folks um i especially out at apl um here in uh, in laurel maryland i so some of their folks work on what's called water migration i a really interesting result 
for that water migration effect was using the SOFIA uh, telescope. So SOFIA was the um, a very large uh, um, infrared stra stratigraphic, or oh goodness, I don't remember the the acronym though, but it was Stratosphere Observatory. Uh, so think of a large infrared and optical telescopes on a on a jetliner. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, Sophia is uh, sadly getting cut, so that's that's a that's a sad day. Okay, well, I've hogged your time enough. Any other questions from anyone? I'm not muted, am I? Okay. No, I can't. I guess I guess yeah. I hear you. Do, do you do you have uh, access to lunar samples at at Goddard? So not at not at Goddard. Uh, so the samples would have to be from NASA Johnson Space Center, oh, okay. uh, and so you would you would have to write pretty much a like I would like this sample, please. Yeah. Uh, and then there's so much paperwork to even get those samples, and then and yeah, it's, it's it's preferred that you don't lose them. Also, I I understand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's that would be a, the uh, a huge important aspect of that of don't lose the moon rock, uh, <laughs> um, but also like don't lick it as well. Um, but there there are samples. I uh, it depends upon again what you want to do. There are samples that are only specific for you know certain yeah. science objectives certain instruments but then there's samples set aside where if you want to purposefully destroy the darn thing to learn about the chemistry there are samples that that you can destroy yeah. and, and but all all for science for a good cause yeah yeah okay Anyone but else? but granted oh, these are like really really tiny samples yeah. really tiny samples I have a question, Chuck, for our presenter. Caitlin, this is Mitch uh, at the Planetarium in Evansville, which is uh, going to do an Artemis show in September. And this this new information that that came out regarding the thirteen landing sites, it looked as if those sites were specific to a, a, a certain part of the lunar day, uh, lunar month. Uh, and I was just wondering if you knew what month in the 28 days uh, the shadows were just right for a safe landing, uh, because I'm not familiar with the geography of the pole. Uh, I, I, so it's got to be somewhere between Lunar Day 7 and 21. I That's didn't a, know whether you knew what day it would be, the, including the show, of course. Oh, yeah. Well, so I'm glad you brought that up that is currently being discussed. So that's actually one of the reasonings of choosing the, the one site for Artemis three. Uh, so that's, that's next steps. It's not just, uh, you know, next steps for me would be what's oh, all the cool geology and, and to kind of formulate the different kinds of science objectives and everything, hooray. Uh, but there, there would be a whole subgroup, other subgroup, uh, in determining landing sites specifically for those shadows. Uh, the shadowing uh, effects like that would be very, very important for not just science though, but very important for communications as well. Uh, and how, how deep do you wanna go at, certain de at some of these certain places um, as well? So next steps for sure, um, but as far as specifics on timing, not not sure yet. That will depend upon which site they pick, which site, and what do you want to do, and how long. Uh, we're not entirely sure how long we would have our astronauts at the South Pole uh, either. So that's uh, still next steps. I mean, it, it's only going to be very, very few days uh, for sure, but still depends upon. I uh, say if you have a, an area that has a lot of shadow and very small window of time for communications, uh, that's going to be very tricky for okay, sure. Well, you've got 13 sites to choose from. There's one that's going to be the best. So 
for for what for everything. Uh, full disclosure before I turn it back to Chuck, uh, we're only working here in Evansville on the live portion of the show that we do. The Fisk Planetarium in Boulder, Colorado, has received funding to do the Artemis Three show called "Forward to the Moon." Uh, it's playing in uh, planetariums across the country now, and we're just getting around to opening it uh, next month. So. It's called Forward to the Moon, everyone, and it will be playing uh, here locally in September. Just uh, finished the encoding today, so it looks really good. It's got a really good monologue uh, by Harrison Schmidt. So those of you that know Harrison, uh, that know Dr. Schmidt, uh, he does a really good job. Uh, it's, it's, I'm going to stop. Chuck? Yeah, we had a chance to meet him um, in uh, Albuquerque, and he... He's got to be the friendliest astronaut I've ever met in my life. Uh, we had a meet and greet with him that uh, where he did book signings and did pictures with people, some of which I can show you in a few minutes. Uh, but then he went and gave a talk and then came down in the audience and mingled and took pictures and signed things for people um, to the point where he was one of the last people in the room. And he's, he's 87 going on 67 and uh, just as sharp as a tack amazing guy absolutely absolutely he, he was a pleasure to meet yeah. for us uh planetary people every once in a while that, yeah um any other all right well, mitch when did you say that would be available locally well what's the first weekend in september let's see okay, it looks well, like it's going to be september 3 okay uh, will be the will be the Evansville premiere and it'd be done I haven't picked the time yet I'm, I'm going to sort that all out later uh it's called forward to the moon uh it's been 50 some years so yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay well, I'm looking forward to that any other questions by anyone no questions uh just on behalf of the Evansville Astronomical Society and all our visitors and guests that have logged on tonight and are with us in the plan, in the uh, observatory, I want to thank you for a, a stupendous presentation. Uh, you're always very energetic and a pleasure to view uh, and, and uh, listen to. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.